Hi, this is Social Political Philosophy. My name is Mark Thorsby, and today we're going to be doing an introduction to Machiavelli's The Prince. Um, some of the critical questions we'll be looking at today um, include uh, what is the relation of virtue to the state? Um, that is, is should a government uh, um, be um, conform to the same moral values of character that we assume other human beings should have? Um, is it more important to appear virtuous or to actually be virtuous? We're going to see that uh, Machiavelli argues that it's better to be feared than loved if you're a statesman, um, and that you should, but you should always appear to be virtuous. Um, but in fact, Machiavelli would argue it's foolish to actually always be virtuous. So it raises some interesting questions because most of us hold our politicians to account on this measure. Um, but the question is, well, maybe they're actually doing what they ought to be doing. Um, anyway, the next question is, what exactly is the best advice for a politician? So all of our future politicians out there, you may be uh, interested in this topic. Anyway, let me pull up our screen here. So welcome back, guys. Uh, I hope you guys are doing well. Today, again, we'll be looking at Machiavelli. And we're going to be looking at the prince. Now, we should say this, is that Machiavelli um, also famously is known for his discourses. Um, we're not going to be, his discourses on Livy, and we're not going to be taking a look at those in this video. We're only going to be looking at the print. So there's more to explore in terms of Machiavelli, and I encourage you to do so. Now, let's talk, start off here. Who exactly was Machiavelli? Let's sort of start off with a brief biography, or at least biographical note. He lived... Um, in the 15th and 16th centuries from 1469 to 1527. Uh, and he was from Florence, uh, is where he's from, Florence City, Italy, or Frienza, Italy. If you've been there, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, um, now, something to know about Florence, just to give you a sense here, uh, Florence in the uh, early part of the Renaissance here, which of course Florence is the sort of home of the Renaissance. Uh, so it's sort of interesting, I guess I could say a little bit since our last video was on Aristotle, what's happened between Aristotle <laughs> and Machiavelli's time? Well, what's happened essentially is that the after Aristotle died, just to give you, bring you up to speed in super quick fashion, um, after Aristotle dies, um, he, right, the, um, the Hellenistic Empire uh, commanded by Alexander the Great collapses or fractures into three different um, kingdoms that are ruled by um, by Alexander's lieutenants and generals. Um, but eventually the Roman Empire emerges, right? And I won't go through that, that's obviously, it's, it, hopefully you've been schooled on this. Um, after the Roman Empire collapses and breaks off into the Eastern Empire, the Byzantine Empire, right? Europe goes into the Dark Ages. And when I say Dark Ages, they're Dark Ages because all ec um, free economic activity that existed during the Roman Empire collapsed. Simultaneous to that, um, there's a huge sort of reaction against the sort of learned scholars, right? And many of the libraries and many of the scholars are killed off in ancient Rome. And in, during this period that we call the Dark Ages, we call it the Dark Ages because we don't know really what happened. Uh, and it lasted for a couple hundred years. Slowly into the Middle Ages, uh, especially by the 12th, 12th century, we see an emergence out of those dark ages for sure. The first universities in Paris and Oxford are founded in, in the, um, the 12th and 13th centuries. Now, by the time we get to Machiavelli, Florence, now remember Florence um, in northern Italy here, um, all of Italy has become a sort of uh, key market hub, especially Ven Venice. Um, but and so we see huge economic activity. Now, Florence is, it, Italy is not a country at this time. Really, it's a series of city-states, very much in, in the sort of vein of the original, um, in the original sort of treatise on the polis that we see in the ancient world. A series of city-states. So each city is sort of in control of each other. Now, Florence is run, uh, is essentially an oligarchic government. Now, in the sense that the Medici families, the Medici family essentially rules Florence. Now, but there's a time um, 
uh, oh, I'm sorry. And then, uh, let's see here. But the thing is, uh, at one point, the Medicis are kicked out of Florence. Now, while they're kicked out of Florence, Machiavelli from the uh, years 1503 to 1506 actually takes charge of the Florentine militia. And he actually organizes a military campaign against neighbor city, neighboring city-state Pisa. You've probably heard of the leading tower of Pisa. So he actually organizes it. When he returns... Uh, the Medicis, in the meantime, return to power, and Machiavelli, after his military campaign, is arrested, he's tortured, and then he's exiled just outside of the city um, in Florence, just outside of Florence. In fact, a, a very good friend of mine who's a Machiavelli scholar, um, a couple summers ago, went to Machiavelli's house where he was in Florence, where he was actually um, exiled. While in exile, he could, from his balcony, see all of the city of Florence. So, but he wasn't allowed to enter the city. Now, while he was in exile during this period, he writes The Prince. Now, what is The Prince? The Prince is a manual. And, of course, he, um, he's particularly interested to sort of give political advice to the Medicis, right? And ultimately to gain favor with the Medicis. Eventually he's able to do so, and he's, he's able to return to public life in 1525. Um, and then of course, two years later, he dies. Now, um, the key works that, that Machiavelli has, right, of course, is the prince and then the dialogues. We're going to be looking at the prince today. And this, and this is a guide manual for uh, political princes um, or those who govern principalities, as it were. Um, the other key work he has here is the Discourses on Livy. And he, of course, has other lesser known works, uh, which I'm obviously not going to talk about. Um, so, but one thing we should mention that's interesting about Machiavelli is that Machiavelli really is also, he is a political player, right? Uh, he's not a philosopher in the same sense that I think we would say Aristotle or Plato were, right? He is a, he is a political player first, a philosopher second. Um, and that's not, that's not meant to say anything bad about Machiavelli. It's simply to emphasize the practical application that his works employ. Because he's ultimately interested in creating, the prince here is a guidebook, it's a manual uh, that effectively tells a prince it's better to be feared than loved, right? But this is a, a, a guidebook here for, we'll say politicians, even though he, wouldn't, he doesn't use that language, a guidebook for politicians or princes, basically people of power. Right. And what he's going to argue here is that if you follow this guidebook, it's going to work out. Now, one of the things I have to mention is because of the time in which the Renaissance is happening, right? The Renaissance, uh, I said that we emerged out of the Dark Ages in the 12th century. That's correct. Or even before the 12th century. Um, but since that time, knowledge had gained more and more. One of the th critical things that happens in Italy that allows um, the Italians to flourish to such an extent is that. Uh, the Jesuit education by the church, the Society of Jesus is formed, and the Jesuits form schools all over Italy and then eventually all over Europe. Um, and they promote a neoclassical education, right? Um, and so th there's a sort of spirit of learning the ancients and the classics. And so uh, Machiavelli is well, well versed in the writings of Cicero and other important political philosophers, certainly, of course. Uh, Plato and these people. Now, Machiavelli is well versed in these people, in these theories and ideas, and in these histories. So, one of the things you see in The Prince is Machiavelli sort of follows a same sort of uh, pattern within the text, right? Machiavelli first will argue for a certain idea, and then second, he'll then provide historical examples, both contemporary for him, as well as, I would say, primarily classic examples, pulling from, uh, in many times, Cicero um, uh, or other histories. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of the text. Um, and I've already been sort of talking about it here. Right. The first thing I would say in terms of reading it is this idea of 
um, ideas argued um, with hist historical evidence. Right. So that is what Machiavelli is going to do. Is going to offer a specific advice or a rule for a prince on how to enga engage and act out their affairs, and he's going to provide historical evidence, right, um, coming from his own day and that of the classical world, right. Uh, and so there's a so it really has the flavor of a schol of a schol of a scholarship here. And that's an important sort of thing, right? And that's because during this time period, we're going to see the birth of science, <laughs> right? Or really roughly after this a little bit. Uh, but the, during this period, knowledge and thinking for one's own sake and arguing from rational means uh, is becoming popularized. So, what, but the main structure of the book, the book essentially comes, let's see here, keep my notes here. The book has mainly five sections. They get addressed. The first section here is what we might call the taxonomy of states. The taxonomy of states. And this is chapters 1 through 11. Sorry, I keep having alarms go off. Um, the tax, this is chapters 1 through 11 of the Prince. And what Machiavelli really does in these chapters is he really outlines the different types of states and the different types of governments that a various various princes might find themselves in, right? So first he identifies the types of states because you're going to see that he's a very sort of situationalist um, philosopher in the sense that what one should do depends upon the circumstances. And so it's very important that one differentiates the types of circumstances there are. So the first is the taxonomy of, the taxonomy of states. And then the second section here is when he begins to talk about military affairs, right? In fact, Machiavelli, um, and this is chapters 12 through 14, uh, Machiavelli argues, for instance, that um, the most important thing for, to maintain a prince's power is having their own military um, and not being dependent upon others. Uh, for those sorts of, for sorts of military engagements. So but he spends a fair good amount, well, not nearly as much as the tax on the states, but he spends some time talking about military affairs. Um, and from chapters 15 to 19, we see that he talks about how a prince should conduct themselves. So we'll call this the section on princely conduct. Okay. And this is chapters 15 through 19. And in this video, I'm going to sort of go through a lot of these chapters briefly, but I'm not going to spend too much time, right? Um, on the fourth section here, we might call it situational advice. And in this section, whoops, we see from chapters 20 to 25, we see Machiavelli talking about very specific types of circumstances um, and how a prince should react. And how, more importantly, I think providing a method to guide how a prince should analyze a specific situation, really. And the last part, section here is really just the last chapter here, um, this chapter 26. And this is an, actually an exhortation to expel the Italian invaders. <laughs> um, and I didn't really take too much time over the Italian history. There's, it's obviously fairly long. Um, but Italy, um, before Machiavelli, I believe while Machiavelli was exiled, um, uh, Rome, to the surprise of all, was actually attacked and sacked uh, by uh, German invaders. And so um, and that was a shock to everyone. And so there was actually um, foreign Europeans were actually occupying Italian lands. And so at the end here, Machiavelli is trying to push this idea, because remember he's writing to princes, and particularly to the princes of his day, and he's saying, it's time to act, we should invade. So it's very sort of interesting because Machiavelli here begins with the sort of description of the state, and then he moves into a, um, I would almost call it a, a, a normative analysis of politics, how one should act, and then finally he ends with the conclusion of a sort of a charge for the, um, 
the contemporary his contemporary readers in terms of expelling the Italian invaders. So the 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 text influence is um, is enormous, um, right? This is an enormously influential text. Um, we're going to see it's not nearly as philosophically critical as the next text we'll be looking at, which is Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. But we're going to see similar sorts of themes developing in Machiavelli's prints that we're going to be able to f more fully unpack in Thomas Hobbes' The Leviathan. In particular, right, we're going to see with this sort of forecasting to, the, to Hobbes, we're going to see with Hobbes that his argument that is that people naturally want and need someone who's stronger than themselves to guarantee the state. So his idea is that politics ends always with the Leviathan, someone on top. And in a certain sense, Machiavelli's Prince Manual here is uh, a guidebook for how one should consider how to act when they're in that sort of um, le uh, Leviathan position or whatnot. Okay? Um, so, there, and it's sort of the other thing I would say here is there's a sort of, we'll see, it, it really comes out later, uh, but there's a term. Um, that comes later, but it's the term real politic. It's a German term, so you can see it doesn't come from uh, it doesn't come from Italy or Machiavelli. But real politic here, at least at this point, is this idea that politics is has to be based upon realism. Remember when we looked at Aristotle? This is sort of a brief review here, right? Uh, but when we looked at Aristotle, Aristotle made a difference here between the idea that the, the statesman has to understand the ideal politics so that they know what to work towards, but they have to also have a good deal of realism because they have to be able to accomplish what is possible given a set of circumstances, right? And so real politic is this fundamental idea, right? Um, you know, and we'll get it when we get to it, uh, sort of the German philosophers later on, we'll, we'll mention this in more detail, right? Uh, but this text is pretty influential because, remember, just to contrast Aristotle here, what was Aristotle's idea? Aristotle's idea, or one of the things he talks about, is that a statesman, right, should be virtuous. Should be virtuous. Uh, oops. Right, that a statesman should actually be virtuous. Uh, we're going to see, though, with Machiavelli, that we make this distinction that maybe the point isn't to be virtuous, but maybe one should appear virtuous, right? Uh, because as this, as the prince uh, sitting up on the high, his duty is to the entire state. Insofar as that duty is, he will have to likely make decisions that would appear immoral, right? And also, his number one goal, Machiavelli says, is to stay in power. And so to stay in power, if one is always virtuous, we're going to see that that's not too realistic in terms of maintaining a state. That's Machiavelli's idea. So Aristotle, but Aristotle by contrast thought, no, 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 one should actually be virtuous. But here we see, no, maybe we should just appear virtuous. So this is a sort of interesting distinction that I think we're going to see played out here as we go. So here's what I want to do as I go through this. I want to sort of, I don't want to take too much of your time. It's already 20 minutes into the video here. What I want to do is kind of step through a number of the chapters um, and just lay out a number of critical ideas that come out in the text, right? And in our reading, I had you, we're just reading excerpts here, but many, a lot of the book we're actually reading here. But let's start by taking a look at chapter five, right? And in chapter five, what Machiavelli addresses is how to govern formally free states. So in this chapter, he's looking at um, the question of governance of free states. Now, um, why is he engaged in this? Because it, right, he's thinking because um, um, when the Medicis were expelled, right, Florence became a free state. Now the Medicis are back in. It's no longer a free state. So, but the question is, how should one govern one of these states? He says there's really three types of action. There's three possibilities, right? The first possibility is to just ruin them, just destroy the states. 
which isn't too good. Um, not if, right, you could just destroy the stage. You can think he gives examples. Remember, every time he gives advice, he'll give examples of people who've done this sorts of things. But you can think Carthage, for instance. Another possibility is to reside in person at the state, right? So if, for instance, one takes over Pisa, right, they could either ruin the state or they could reside there in person. And the final possibility here is they could permit self-rule. Uh, and, and and collect a tribute or a tax, right? So the possibility is one, you can destroy a state, right? If you take over another state, you could A, destroy it, and B, you could stay there in person to govern, or C, you could allow them to govern themselves, and but they just have to pay a tax or a tribute of some sort to you, right? Um, oftentimes, it makes more sense to have a free state to go this route. Why? Because, Machiavelli says, because citizens in a free state have already tasted liberty. And since they've tasted liberty, uh, it's going to be much, they're going to be much more it's impalpable for them uh, to be governed under a single prince, under a monarch here, here um, as opposed to governing themselves, right? I mean, he's going to say also within the same chapter that um, oftentimes the... Um, uh, states, it's in easiest to govern a state that's already accustomed to having a prince um, for, I think, pretty obvious reasons. Now, Machiavelli in this, in this section actually offers quite a bit of advice um, in terms of oligarchic rule. The Medici family is a perfect example of oligarchy. Um, and so, in the earlier chapters here, Machiavelli has distinguished between these different types of government. We'd already distinguished them in the course, so we didn't read through them. Um, but uh, Machiavelli talks about here, this is an important question if he wants to maintain oligarchic rule. Now, again, because of uh, the city that's accustomed to freedom, has they're either going to uh, rebel uh, because they want freedom or because they want to protect their ancient rights or the way things used to work. So it's obviously easier to win cities, cities accustomed to princely rule. So that's sort of what happens in chapter 5. Now let's take a look at chapter 6. Um, and here he talks about the acquisition the acquisition of principalities. Now, what is a principality? A principality is the region under control of the prince. Right? So the principality is the region under control. Now, what does he argue? He argues that it's better to gain by ability than chance. Right? Um, right? It's best to gain by ability. Now, one of the things here is, where are these, all of these rich families coming from? Now, during the Middle Ages, before the Renaissance, and still during the Renaissance, right, Europe is divided into fiefdoms, that is, small mini-kingdoms, in which you have a single sort of king or a single sort of ruler. Now, in the Middle Ages, this was very, fairly gruff and, uh, you know, fairly hard life, and the economics weren't that good. Um, right, people were living on subsistence levels for the most part. But essentially, what had occurred is two classes developed in the Middle Ages in Europe. The first class here is the I say the commoners, right, the laborers, and the second class um, is the noble class. And the noble class are those people who own the property. But the thing is, the noble class is also charged with the protection of the, of the commoners that live within the fiefdom. Now, but over time, especially in Italy, what in Italy is a little bit different, I suppose, than if you're thinking Northern Europe or France, right? But what occurs over time is that eventually city-states emerges and merchants develop. And what we see here is a tremendous, especially in these city centers, we see a tremendous sort of kind of de, um, a sort of restructuring of economic dynamics because especially Italy with all their its port cities, is becoming tremendously wealthy with all of its merchants um, who are just traveling around the world getting spices and this sort of thing, right? So, um, so the, what happens is the oligarchic rule eventually is the class of nobles that's sort of 
it has the historically out of these nobles and they want to protect what they have and of course they also want to protect their business interests and this sort of thing but here's the idea is that some princes right because they are their royalty right um, you know the higher higher grade princes I suppose right they've gained a lot of their wealth simply through their family through their bloodline and what he's going to argue here is that Essentially, acquiring a principality by a mere chance or accident or fortune is not as good as by ability. Because if you're actually able to do this, uh, then, um, then obviously you're in a much better position to hold on to the state. Um, so it's interesting because chapter 6 here is something of an, uh, a spot where Machiavelli seems to be advocating that's the distinction in terms of on uh, right he already talked about the idea of principalities acquired through fortune uh, they're harder to hold on to um, a key uh, but ones are acquired by arms like, the important distinction here is the difference between plundering versus governing oops not giving governing all right it, this is important because he says Right, it's one thing for a prince to come in and take over a country and to just steal all the property, um, but that's not going to be very wise in the long run. Right, the real goal of a prince wants to maintain control of the principality is to actually govern, and so the task of governing is the fundamental task, and that's really the most difficult task, really. Um, so, plundering versus governing, but the goal is to govern. Right. Uh, and that's a pretty important distinction. He also mentioned something fairly important here at the very end when he talks about what I would say is he also announces that a prince must be shrewd, right? A prince must be shrewd. And that's my language, not his. But let me read you this passage. He says, He who considers it necessary to, conce uh, to secure himself in his new principality, to win friends, to overcome enemies either by force or fraud, or to make himself beloved and feared by the people, to be followed and revered by the soldiers, to exterminate those who have power or reason to hurt him, to charge the old order of things for a new one, to be severe and gracious, magnanimous and generous, to destroy a disloyal army and to create a new one, to maintain friendship with kings and princes in such a way that they will help him enthusiastically and will be careful not to offend him. He who desires all of this cannot but be a better, find a better example to follow the actions than this man, right? And what he says, he says, right, the prince has to be um, seen as both vicious and virtuous, right? Um, the prince should destroy his enemies, exterminate those who have power against him, right? So he his idea, that doesn't sound like a picture of the Aristotelian concept of the statesman, right? Because here we see that in a much more realistic sense that the prince is, if the prince wants to maintain power, right, he has to be feared as well as loved. Right? And ultimately, though, fear is more important than probably than being loved. Now, then he goes to talk, talk about what about principalities um, acquired by wickedness? Right. And so in this sense, he says, well, right, there's two other there's two ways that one can acquire a principality. One is through being wicked. The other is through the favor of its citizens. Right. Uh, that's two possibilities, right? Either by being wicked, right? Or by favor of the citizens, right? Gaining the principality. And what he says is that wickedness uh, is paying no attention to the obligation to others. Now, what is he right? Here, a principle gets announced, I think, in for Machiavelli. And the principle here is that there is a duty, right, to others, right that the prince has a duty to others right that the prince isn't there simply by virtue of maintaining his own power or wealth but that ultimately he has a duty to protect the, his own principality to protect the state and that's how one wins favor right but wickedness right is when the prince pays no attention they ignore obligations right so you can see here there's already a sort of kind of, I would say, a uh, 
a sort of inkling of an idea here that there's a universal source of objectivity in terms of how one ought to conduct the state, right? And he also raises the question concerning the permanent success of tyrants, right? And this comes out on page 33, at least if you're using our textbook here, right? Um, let's see here, 253, I apologize, right? Um, and, right, a question that gets raised concerning the success of tyrants. He says, but now let us consider the second case where a leading citizen becomes the prince of a country, not by weakness, by, but, uh, oops, I'm sorry. I'm looking, I was looking at chapter 9, my apologies. Let's see. He says, we should therefore note that in seizing a state, the usurper ought to consider carefully what injuries it is necessary for him to inflict and to do them all at one stroke so as not to have them to repeat them daily. And remember, because of Machiavelli's time here, he's talking about the idea that, okay, it's, this is not good to win by wickedness, but the problem, though, is that you actually, when you, t when you actually first acquire a principality, you have to commit some wickedness, uh, which means that you have to, like he said in the earlier chapter, you have to destroy those who are against you. But here he's advocating, saying, do this all at one stroke. Right? Do this all in one stroke rather than prolonging the pain. Because if you're seen as a tyrant as constantly executing people, right, eventually you'll never win the favor of the people. And when the opportunity occurs, right, you'll lose your principality or your life, probably both. Right? Now, but here he wants to say, so you want to get rid of this weakness because you need to develop the appearance of virtue so that they'll love you. Um, I, I found out the, um, the passage I was looking for in terms of tyrants. Why is there permanent success of tyrants? It's just above that passage I read. He says, Some may wonder how it can happen that Agathles and his like, after infinite treacheries and cruelties, right, that's the tyrant I'm thinking of, are able to live for so long secure in their own country and are able to defend themselves from external enemies and never be conspired. And then he goes on a little bit later. He says, I believe that all this depends on whether cruelty is badly or properly used. So here we see in the same chapter Machiavelli making a distinction in terms of the use of cruelty, right? He thinks that there is um, bad cruelty, and on the other hand, that there's properly used cruelty, right? Now notice here, the only way that cruelty can be good is if it's properly used. That means that cruelty here is a utility, right? That one uses cruelty for ends, right? And you can see here, this is, we might introduce a term here, which is known as consequentialism. And consequentialism is the idea that um, something is justified if the consequences um, are favorable, right? So an action, a means, or a method is justified if it has good consequences. So you can see here, if we were having the debate about whether or not it's okay to torture people, you can see here that Machiavelli would clearly say it is okay if the utility is is worth it, right? Um, if it's used properly. But just torturing people in many other ways is bad. Why? It goes back to the same utility. It creates disfavor among the citizens, right? And the goal is to maintain the principality. So one has to utilize wickedness very well, right? For instance, Machiavelli would, would likely argue that, I think, the Machiavellian response would be, um, yeah, use torture in the war on terror, but don't tell anyone you're using torture. So that way you can maintain the appearance of virtue, right? Okay, let's see here. The Chapter 9 here, let's take a look at what Chapter 9 is about. Chapter 9 concerns um, civil principalities. Okay, now... Uh, remember here, a, a principality can either be created in one of two ways, right? A principality is either created by the citizens or it's created by the nobles, right? So it depends on, so it can go either way, right? Um, it's harder to maintain a civil principality um, if uh, a noble captures it, right? Um, okay. Now, there's an interesting distinction, because then what it seems to be in this chapter, what Machiavelli goes into a discussion of, is he goes into a question of, how does one deal with nobles? Because another, another one of the more difficulties is, if a prince, uh, a foreign prince obtains power of 
a foreign principality that's ruled with nobles, then the question really gets raised, how does one deal with the nobles, right? That is, the other people in the upper class uh, within the society, right? Um, now, that means that in terms of dealing with the nobles, right, they're either going to be, right, um, for or against you, um, obviously. Obviously, if they're against you, then you have to deal with them shrewdly, right? Um, if they're for you, then the question you have to ask, Magdalene says, is are they greedy or not, right? Right? If they're greedy, then that means they can never love you. By the way, this is the negation symbol. Sorry. That just means negation. Um, it's a symbol in uh, logic there, right? So that means that they're never going to love you. But what you need, but the people who are not greedy, right? That means that it is capable for them to honor and love. We'll put love and honor. It's possible, right? which means that you need to cultivate this group of people, avoid this group of people, destroy this group of people, right? You can see here, so what he's arguing here is, he's sort of laying out the structure of class relations um, from the prince's perspective, right? And giving very sort of realistic advice here, right? Okay, chapter 10. How to measure the strength of a principality. We'll just call this strength. Of a principality. Let's see. Right? The strength of a principality. Now, what is strength defined as? He makes it very clear strength is defined as the war making capacity. Right? So that means for Machiavelli, the strength of a prince is determined by how, how easily they can uh, engage in a war, right? And he's thinking in particular here about engaging in, a, um, in advancing a war, really, right? Because he defines, he says, well, who is weak? A weak prince is the prince, right, who has no war-making capacity, and they rely on the defense of the city's walls and things of that sort, right? But essentially... <coughs> Pardon me. They have no war-making power, right? Um, so that so that means, of course, that the strength of a prince depends upon the army that the prince has, right? Um, in chapter eleven here, I won't talk too much about chapter eleven. Um, chapter eleven just concerned principalities, regard ecclesiastical principalities. An ecclesiastical principality for in particular here is the Vatican, right? This is states that are owned and governed by the state. Now, in general, he says the, the thing is an ecclesiastical principality is maintained by religion, right? Because if people stop believing in the religion, then they're no longer going to have any power. Um, and on the other hand, ecclesiastical principalities are, because of the religious component, are much more um, tied to... Uh, the more the moral uh, teachings of the church and thus their power is also constrained right um, so uh, so he doesn't in the, my general sense is here in this section that uh, Machiavelli is really he's just sort of I think he's talking about this is a type of principality because in Italy one would have to deal with the Vatican and an ecclesiastical principalities today this is not so any, any longer um, so there's not really too much I really want to focus on there. Chapter 12 gets interesting because then he talks about um, troops and the types of troops in the military. Because remember, strength of a principality is defined by their war-making capacity. The war-making capacity has everything to do with one's troops, right? Now he says, what is it we need? There's two requirements for a good state. Um, two requirements. Right? The first requirement for a state is a good army. Right? And when we say army, this could include, for in our day, the notion of the police. Right? You need good enforcement. Right? And then, of course, you need good laws. 
right? Both of these, a prince is supposed to be dealing with. We're going to see that one, especially when we get to um, John Locke, right? That eventually the, this will become identified here as the executive, right? So maybe we can put that over to the side here in a different color. Um, What? I don't... Hmm. Anyway, I can't find every color, but we'll see later that this eventually, after political philosophers are mulled over for a while, this becomes known as the executive power of the monarch, right? That is their capacity to enforce the laws, right? And, of course, this is, becomes known as the... I'll just put L-E-G here, but as the legislative power of the of the prince here right but you need both of these it's interesting machiavelli says this one is the one that really matters the most a good army why because if you have good laws but no good army if you have no way to enforce good laws then the laws are useless which means that the first thing the prince needs to be concerned about here is me is having the strength to actually enforce the laws and then worry about the laws so it seems to me that machiavelli argues here that uh, the army right Having a good army has logical priority. Well, let's just put to make it more similar. Having a good army takes um, um, priority for the prince. Okay, which makes a lot of sense, but we'll see that we actually see the reverse argument being made here because you could take this meaning that that means that the executive powers are more important than the legislative powers. Uh, well, yes and no. We'll see when we get to John Locke that, wait a second, the logical priority relationship really should rest with the laws. And that's an interesting debate here. What is more important? Who actually has more power in our day, the Congress or the president, the executive or the legislator? Which one has priority? Um, for him, it's this. Now, that means that the question becomes one of troops, right? Now, there's four types of troops that are possible. One can have troops that are um, one's own army, right? They can also hire mercenaries. Um, they can also gain auxiliary forces. An auxiliary force is a foreign uh, are sets of foreign troops um, that one is using, right? You made a, a prince has made a deal with another prince um, in order to win the war, and they're using auxiliary forces. And finally, one can have mixed troops. Now, what's the problem? He says number one, mercenaries are uh, not good, right? He initially he immediately says hiring mercenaries is going to be problematic because number one, mercenaries only care about their paid. Right, which means they don't fight that hard, right? And they're undisciplined, he says, um, because they're for higher troops. Auxiliary forces are not good troops either because auxiliary forces don't have a dog in the fight, dog in the hunt, as it were, right? The auxiliary forces are there at the command of their prince, but this is not their war, um, and, they're, and they don't integrate well. The best thing to do is to have one's own forces, their own army. Uh, now, obviously... Depending on the type of engagement, right, mixed troops, having auxiliary forces or mercenaries may be necessary, right? We see this happening today in our very own day and time, right? Um, for instance, when the United States went to Afghanistan with a joint venture, right, with other states, we have auxiliary forces, right? Another example here would be um, in, when during the... Um, the Libyan war that occurred, uh, I think it was a year or two ago, right? Um, before Muammar Gaddafi was captured and then killed, right? He hired mercenary troops. He hired other people from other countries to fight his war, right? The best thing you have is one's own army, right? And you're not paying them. They're there, sim well, you'll probably have to pay them, but, but they're still your army, right? They're not for higher troops. They're your own permanent force. And that clearly is the most important. Uh, because it's very difficult to command auxiliary mercenary, I'm sorry, um, yeah, mercer, mercenary forces. So chapter 13 then, then turns to a question of soldiers and the types of soldiers. Right? And he immediately talks about the auxiliary forces. Auxiliary forces are useless. 
um, or not useless, but they're from a powerful neighbor, but they're ultimately not as advantageous. And again, they actually does sort of call them useless directly, right? Um, and he has a very important thing here in this section uh, where he talks about the idea that uh, it's really quite necessary because another problem with having auxiliary forces is when one integrates a foreign power into their own military war-making power, they could easily be usurped, right? Because uh, one's uh, ally could become one's enemy, right? And so he talks about this, that it's important that the prince that for the prince that evils must be recognized ahead of time. Evils must be recognized ahead of time, right? And that a principality needs that the principality needs its own soldiers, right? And the idea here is that the soldiers belong to the principality, meaning they're native to the principality. Because who's going to fight more for one's own land? The people who live there or the people that don't? Right, and so that so that's he's just sort of advocating that same notion here. Now, in chapter fourteen, he begins a little bit more thorough discussion here of the art of war. What does it mean to conduct war, and how should one conduct it? Right, the key, he says, the number one thing that's really critical is organization. Um, and here again, I love Machiavelli here because this is utterly practical advice. Uh, the key is actually having organization, right? And basically organizing the bureaucracy in the chain of command, right? He writes that when men think about luxury, right? Um, then the war, when it comes to war, they're going to lose, right? And he says the soldiers, and he, he even advocates that there are times when the prince needs to just go straight down and become a captain in the battle too, Right, uh, because ultimately the soldiers to have a good soldier, if one has one's own army, the best way to conduct it is you want those soldiers to love you. And soldiers, he says, for instance, don't like um, uh, generals or monarchs who are so uh, decadent that they have no taste or understanding of what war is about. Right. So he says that one of the things in order to be well organized is that the soldiers need to be they need to be not only organized, but they need to be well drilled, right? That is, they need to be trained and exercised, right? Um, and he says, he actually says, you got to keep them hunting, right? Because he says, you want to keep them engaged and practicing. And I think that would be the thing for us, is his emphasis here is that soldiers need to be trained, right? Soldiers need to be trained. And they need to be consistently trained over and over, right? Um, and then finally, he says, the prince ought to study history, right? Study old battles, right? And here he sort of consistently says, listen, these princes who are decadent and who just prefer luxury and wine and parties and never studied military history and have gained on top of it their principality through fortune or through bloodline, right? These people are going to lose their principality because they're not maintaining the organization. They don't study the history. Um, and ultimately, they're not loved by their people or their soldiers, right? Okay, chapter 15 here. I'm just moving through these here. Um, one thing that's really important in this section, um, this is where he talks about praise and blame. And here, this is a sort of, if you will, if we want to put it in sort of 21st century language, this is this, this, is this chapter where he begins to talk about... Um, the public relations side of politics, if you will, right? But something important philosophically occurs. He makes the difference between the is and the ought. This is called known as the is-ought distinction. Later on in moral philosophy, we come to know as the naturalistic fallacy. If you're in my course, it's on, we're looking at page 361 is where this is located. Let me pull it up here and read you a section here uh, from this. Well, I want to read you this to you. <clears throat> because it's actually pretty critical in terms of understanding the this difference we were talking about in terms of being versus appearing, right? Uh, let's see here. Right, he says, neglecting to consider what is done because one is concentrating on what ought to be done, 
is more likely to lead to ruin than to preservation, right? Neglecting to consider is in favor of ought will lead to ruin. What is he saying here? He's saying, listen, what's most important is to understand what is actually happening, right? That is, if you focus on the ought, which is focusing on the norms, right? Um, the norms on how things should be, trying to create a better world, right? This is greater chance of leading to ruin. Then instead, focusing on, in, uh, instead focusing on a description, and then determining action based upon that, right? And here you can see this is a more direct note way of saying, listen. The first thing to notice here is that the prince has to be realistic, right? And the prince should try to figure out how to. The prince should neglect the way things act, what actually is happening in order to construct the way things ought to be. Once you focus on is rather than not. The other thing you mentioned here is that a prince has to know how to do wrong, right? Uh, right. There's this notion here of knowing how to do evil. <laughs> What's his idea here, or harm, I should say, or doing wrong? He says one has to be um, prudent, right? Be prudent. That is, if one has to, I mean, in these, remember here, we're talking about sort of, uh, sort of late Renaissance, I'm sorry, uh, early mid-Renaissance sorts of politics here, right? But if one has to commit evil, one has to know how to do it in such a way as to maintain um, the appearance of virtue, right? But on the other hand, not always, right? Because you also want uh, people to be afraid of you too. Because uh, fear is critical in terms of maintaining power, he thinks. Now you can see this is obviously non-democratic discussion, right? But he has to know how to do wrong. One has to be prudent. He also says here that one should avoid scandal. Um, right? And the idea here is that, right, if you're going to get blamed if you have lots of scandals, right? You'll get praised if you're prudent, right? And if you commit wrong, but you commit wrong in a prudent sense, then he, then Machiavelli seems to advocate that that's okay, right? Of course, one would only commit harm, right, if the actual state of affairs demanded it, right? What I'm, I'm not doing a good job here, but what I want to do is sort of give you a sense of how all this stuff begins to tie and mesh together. Let's move here to chapter 17. Chapter, se to, uh, chapter 17 talks about cruelty um, and mercy. Now, in his day, right, the prince here has a sort of absolutist sort of power, uh, where they can, of course, they are the law maker as well as the executive. So, um, whereas our system is very different, right? Now, here's what he says. He says, mercy is good, but cruelty is not too bad either, <laughs> right? So, here, mercy is good, but cruelty is not too bad. Now, why? I mentioned before that we can understand... Uh, Machiavelli here is a consequentialist, right? Consequentialism. The idea here being that cruelty isn't bad if it's used in such a way as to result in good consequences, right? That is in terms of gaining fear where fear is necessary. He says, for instance, he gives some really, I think, prudent advice actually. He says, that means that a prince should be slow to act, but yet should show no fear. So a prince should not be running around chopping people's heads off. They should be slow to act, right? One should, he says that the prince should also desire to be both loved and feared, right? Loved and feared. A prince wants both, right? But ultimately, fear is more fundamental. Uh, because without, because uh, fear without hatred can lay the foundation um, for control. Right, and that's his idea. You have to, when fear gains hatred, then you end up in a state where rebellion becomes likely, right? But one should desire to be both feared and loved, but fear is more fundamental, more foundational, we might say. Chapter 18 here is the question of, should a prince keep, he talks about, should a prince keep his promise? So we'll put keeping promises. And the answer is, well, yes, as much as possible, um, but no, not when, um, 
ultimately something dangerous is about to occur. So one of the things he mentions, for instance, is a good Lord should not keep faith if it dangers him, right? So that means that one can renege on their promises here if there's mortal danger either to the power or to the state. A wise man, he says, though, will conceal this, that one should always maintain the appearance Oops. Maintain the appearance of character. In fact, he's, he actually mentions the virtues that need, one needs to have. They need to appear merciful. Right? They need to appear faithful. And when I say faithful, the notion here is not the religious notion. It's the notion that one has to maintain the faith towards, uh, maintain the faith of their duties, if you will. They have to also appear humane. Right? They have to appear upright. And then finally, he says, they have to appear religious. Now, it's interesting. We don't, in the United States, for instance, we don't, we don't live in an age, uh, we live in a very different age than Machiavelli did, but notice that each of these could be applied to the way, um, right, even, for instance, the president would want to be viewed, right? Uh, of course, their powers are constrained, obviously, but they, right, our presence today still appears somewhat religious, um, somewhat upright, humane, faithful, merciful. I think they maintain these appearances. Um, but what's interesting is that because of the cruelty issue, Machiavelli thinks that when cruelty is committed, it has to be balanced and done in a prudence way, in a prudential way, so as to maintain these sorts of appearances. Okay, um, so you can see here, this is a real sort of, I don't know, consequentialist, and I think in many ways it sort of validates some of the cynicism that people have. Right, chapter nineteen, he's adv he advocates the prince needs to avoid being despised. The prince needs to avoid being despised. Now, that means how is one to avoid it? He says, avoid taking property. Right? So that means that part of the way that one avoids um, being despised is by maintaining property rights, right? Um, I'm not going to write all this out because my computer here is working a little bit slow, it seems, right? And in fact, uh, well, let me just keep going here. Uh, but he says, for instance, that means one should avoid the reputation of be appearing changeable, effeminate, mean-spirited, irresolute. And instead, right, the prince should show greatness, courage, gravity, and fortune, right? Um, in fact, I have some pre-written notes. I'm going to use the. I'm going to move over and use those. I think instead, um, so I can pull you out here, because we're running out of time in this video, and I don't like it. Okay. Right. Okay. Let me just walk through these. Right. That a prince should avoid being despised. That they should avoid taking property. And he says they should avoid taking women. Right. Uh, don't take people's women either. And, and that sounds, we have to be careful, of course, in his day, women are conceived of along lines of property, right? That's a sort of interesting historical note that we'll have to come back to here to analyze uh, what is now. Again, there's the prudential part. This is a, a guidebook part of the, of the um, book. But then you avoid appearing changeable, effeminate, means for irresolute. And instead they should show greatness, courage, gravity, and fortitude. Right, and there's two principal fears. Right, there's internal strife and foreign powers. Um, these are two things that ultimately the prince is worried about: is the internal strife and foreign powers, and the strategy. Uh, one must avoid a strategy against conspiracy. Right, and the greatest strategy against having people conspire against you is have the people on your side. That's why it's so critical, he argues, um, for the prince to maintain appear the appearance of virtue, to maintain the esteem of the people. Now, how does one gain the esteem of people? And this is chapter 20. He says, well, through great deeds and effective rule, right? 
and emphasis here on great deeds, doing things that um, go beyond the normal expectations of the citizens, and having effective rule. That's quite critical, right? He says that the prince needs to demonstrate outstanding ability in internal affairs, right? That's the effective rule part. And they need to avoid foreign alliances with other powers that are actually more powerful than their, their own, right? Avoid powerful friends because powerful friends will, he thinks, typically utilize, use your state, your principality for their own interest, right? And of course, even today, foreign affairs within the United States is governed according to a discussion of interest, state interest. Now, that means that in order to govern effectively, one has to have good advisors because one can't govern on their own. Now, how do you choose your advisors, he says? He says there's three types of advisors. Right? There are advisors who have self-comprehension. They can think for themselves, and these are excellent um, advisors. The second, these are people, there are second types of people who are second type of intellect here, which is comprehension through others. You under, the people understand only when they're with other people to explain it and this sort of thing. And these people are good. Right? And there's some people who have no comprehension. They have no capacity to think for themselves. These people are useless. You obviously want advisors who are excellent. And you want to have advisors who, who are there for honor and not greed, to link it back to that earlier chapter we mentioned. Right? A good prince gains loyal advisors. And they gain loyal advisors by honoring and rewarding those advisors who are good. But the, but the prince should also avoid flatterers, people who are trying to talk their way into getting power, um, right? And that ultimately the prince here should always seek the truth. The prince, he says, should develop a reputation for wanting to know what people actually think, not simply hearing, um, what pe what, hearing what other people think they want to hear, right? This is actually a problem in terms of contemporary politics. It's sometimes called the White House bubble, right? The president of the United States is surrounded by people who always call him Mr. President, right? And there's a natural tendency um, for people in the White House bubble um, to want to please the president, which means the president may actually be, not, may not always get the truth. And that the president, or in this case, the prince needs to seek the truth. And a prince who is not wise himself will never get good, will never um, listen to good advice. So it's an interesting thing here. He says that, yeah, you can have really wise uh, advisors, but a wise advisor is not going to make a prince wise, right? So you'd want to avoid having foolish princes, right? Now, then in chapter 24, he begins to talk about why Italy lost um, some of the um, some of its other princes, um, and he actually says laziness, and I think this book here, where it's talking about sort of the prudential aspects of governing, is really meant in this sense. And then finally, chapter 25, it talks about good fortune and luck, right? And he says a prince will fail if he simply relies on fortune, but ultimately it's better to be adventurous. It's better to be more adventurous than cautious. Um, that's how one commits great deeds and how one actually does things that are great. Now, finally, chapter 26, as I mentioned, is the exhortation for Italian liberation, okay? So that is a real sort of quick walk through Machiavelli's Prince. Uh, I've given you a lot of different things. Hopefully, I feel like the lecture is a bit disjointed, but hopefully you can see how he's really sort of integrating a fuller perspective. But the real notion here that I want you to be thinking about is this distinction between on the one side, um, this distinction on the one side of um, emphasizing that we ought to appear virtuous, but not necessarily be virtuous, this real politic moment. Right? And you can see this is a sharp divide, and we're going to see this division strikingly, because when we looked at Plato, right, Plato had this, his whole political system was just dreamed out of his head. It's totally idealistic. Aristotle's is much more prudential, but it's still governed by this ethos of reason, right? The idea that one ought to be virtuous. When they get into the modern era, right, we're going to see a very different view developing, right? And that's the idea that men are ultimately egoistic and they're selfish and they're going to do what they want. And so you have to create a political system that manages that natural disposition. And that means one has to work shrewdly and actually think very practically in terms of how politics must be conducted, not simply by governing um, according to one's whim or without reason. So you can see here, this is the first inkling of, I think, what we'll see in 
much more systematic detail when we look at Thomas Hobbes. Anyway, this has been a long video. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys online.